Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here and I'm back with a new audio commentary. Rob Hill, aka The Bad Movie Bible, is joining me to discuss the 2004 film Alien vs Predator. Now I decided upon this movie after Rob revealed to me that he quite likes this movie, which took me by surprise. So let's hope Rob explains himself throughout this commentary and maybe he can change my mind or even some of you out there but I doubt it. <laughs> anyway, folks, you can listen to this commentary by itself, but if you wish to sync this up to the movie, this is the underrated version, I would like to note, on Blu-ray or on NTSC DVD. Put the timestamp to zero and press play now. So this came out when I was a projectionist, very early on into my projection career. And, um, you know, I think beforehand, everyone kind of knew this was going to be a sort of watered down version because the rating was basically it's a 15 mm. so going into it you kind of knew that it was uh, going to be quite I think it's actually quite tame for a 15 even at, in 2004 but if it was a 12 that would have I think it would have killed it box office wise um, but you know I like a kid, as a kid I, I loved the comics I played the video game even on the uh, old Atari Jaguar so I love the idea of them sort of coming together to fight each other well, I know Sigourney Weaver kind of poo-pooed the idea very early on. I think during the making of Alien 3, she, she had mentioned that this kind of Alien vs. Predator comic was doing well, and she, and they'd, I think, brought up the idea of making a movie, and she was, like, dead against it. Yeah. Um, but uh, obviously there was the rumblings that, you know, uh, that Ridley Scott was going to um, direct a movie, like the fifth Alien movie, with James Cameron writing. That was I, I always thought was kind of, like, mad sort of fan fiction, you know, sort of, sort of, <laughs> or, or sort of like a fan rumor that got out of control. But he did confirm it that they, this was this was a thing. But they, obviously, that would eventually get parlayed into what would be Prometheus. Yeah, and then Paul comes in with this idea for AVP, do it on essentially cheap budget, fifty k, fifty million. Sorry, not fifty k. That'd be well good. <laughs> be so cheap, but fifty million roughly, and turn it around and make a make a good profit because Paul had already proved himself that he could make successful movies on a relatively moderate budget couldn't it yeah exactly yeah yeah and it, no it, it definitely was a thing the the ridley scott james cameron and sigourney weaver dream team i read there's a really good interview with cameron actually on um ain't it cool news remember that oh yes still going i think but it's not is it really <laughs> yeah harry knowles i don't think is involved anymore but it's still it's still clinging on with dear life the website is <laughs> But the, yeah, he's, he, the interviews with Quint, not Knowles. But um, he does go into it. Cameron does go into it, and it sounds like it was essentially good to go. He was happy with the script. Uh, Sigourney Weaver had read it and agreed, in principle, to be in it. Mm. Scott had read it and agreed, in principle, to direct to direct it. And then this was announced, <laughs> which had been <laughs> I think it had been floating around for a while, hadn't it? Since um, yeah, since the early nineties. Oh, for sure. And, it, for whatever reason, it, it it didn't get going. I've read different things. I read the, there, there are six producers between the Alien and Predator franchises, and they all had to be kept happy, and a lot of them didn't get on, and there was history and so on. So I think that was a problem. And also Fox were just focused on making three and four. Mm. But, yeah, I, I, Cameron literally said that this... this this kills the entire idea of an alien film to me. There's there can be no more alien films after this. It's like making Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Yeah, and yeah. it ruins everything. So we walked away wanted nothing to do with it. He refused to watch this movie even now. I think um, Ridley Scott. Yeah. yeah, I mean the, the opening shot that we just saw with the satellite, which looks like the Queen's head, and it rotates round. Incredible stuff. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a good uh, sort of you know sort of fake sort of like surprise to people. But um, it's also not the kind of thing you'd put in a proper film, in a way. You know, that, that's not going to happen in Prometheus, which... That's, I, kind, of, that's, that's kind of fan-baiting, isn't it? It's sort of teasing you to something. Yeah, it, it's, it's a step beyond, and there is Frankenstein and the Wolfman. In fact, I've got, I've got a theory about that. So the, 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 the assumption is that that little shot of Frankenstein and the Wolfman is just a reference to the fact that this is a similar kind of, you know, meeting of, of IPs. Yeah. Cameron specifically said, apparently, to um, the Fox people that this is like making Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. It's 
ridiculous. It's the stupidest idea ever. Yeah. So I've it's gone through my mind. I wonder if that got back to Paul W. S. Anderson and the and the inclusion of that shot there is a reference to Cameron's car. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but oh, well, I think it's a little uh, little little joke there. You know, a little stab at it. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, Paul had. Uh, uh, Paul's a weird one because he's made so many movies now. He still keeps getting still gets movies commissioned, you know, gets relatively large budgets now. But his the output is always disappointing to a large degree. Not all the time, but there's you know, when I saw Mortal Kombat, I thought it was amazing in my teenage years. I still think it's really watchable. Mm. Uh, Event Horizon as we sort of a a massive class cult classic now mm. uh, that didn't perform that well, but it's it's a really effective horror film. Eventually, also essentially got Hellraiser in space after Hellraiser was already in space. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then he sort of followed up with Soldier, that kind of bombed in the USA, went straight to video in the UK, and everyone that's still got a bit of a cult following. People calling it this sort of spin-off to Blade Runner because there's one of those. David Peoples had co-written it, and there was a Blade Runner. That one of those police spinner cars are in the background mm. somewhere, and it refers to replicants in some little graphic near the beginning. But I mean, it's <laughs> loose terms, basically, in a connected to Blade Runner. But I didn't think it was a great movie. I thought it was very flawed. Um, and it sort of came back with Resident Evil, which did well, yeah. and a movie I kind of it's it's watchable. But as a fan of that franchise, it's it's a massive kind of mishap, and um, and the sequels just got worse and worse. Um, but then, you know, due to his success, he got given this, and again, made another made another successful movie. But he seems to pick IP or franchises that are beloved, and he sort of kind of fucks them up. But yeah, still that's makes a, money. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good point, actually. Yeah, he he loves these established franchises, uh, IPs, and. But then doesn't always, like Resident Evil is a great example, doesn't actually use an awful lot of them. I mean, there's no, if I'm, I think I'm right, in, so I'm not a gamer, but I think I'm right in saying there are no characters from the Resident Evil game series in the Resident Evil movie. The first one, anyway, the I know first, they're, they're introduced. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's all kind of like new characters. Or why, yeah, I, everything else is, I think that the, the sequels very much kind of just pull the characters in just for, to please the fans, but they're just, either the characters are wrong or they have no kind of like, backstory to just pop up oh look it's so it's chris redfield from blah 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 you know yeah i, th- I think he gets these opportunities because number one if, if you see him in interviews he's a he gives good talk like he, he you get the impression he could convince you of anything and he does them cheap doesn't he that's the thing he, he can he can do them cheap and fast as well I, I think the the production schedule for this was ridiculous and i know it was on event horizon as well mm like start to finish because event horizon only got made because he, he soldier was his big reward for mortal Kombat being a hit yeah so he got to make soldier his dream and it, it uh, i think it was yes kurt russell was um wanting to take a few months off to beef up before he that's right before he yeah. filmed it so anderson literally filled that time making event horizon he kind of knocked it out in six months or something yeah i think i think paul is at his best when he's not writing the script or being involved yeah, with the writing. Yeah. His writing's mostly awful. Which yeah. I, I always, Evan always says bad stuff about Paul. And I always feel bad because when you see him in interviews, he does come across as a lovely guy. A really mm. cool night. Really, as a guy you'd happily sit down with, have a few beers with and talk about films. Yeah, he's, he's a got, fan. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I just kind of just... The sort of translation of fan to filmmaker kind of is a bit skewed with his, you know, interpretation of this material. And you sort of step back and say to him, look, you've kind of... Why are you doing this? Why have you, why have you made this character so different to what it's supposed to be? And and um, and the beauty of the Predator films and the Alien films, especially what I suppose when everyone thinks about the Alien franchise, it's kind of aliens when it comes to the Colonial Marines and those characters. So you've got essentially kind of the combination of Predator, Predator One and Aliens into one movie, and both those movies have great human characters characters you, you don't want to die you want them to survive mm. you want them to win and in this i don't care about any of them yeah i want them all to die because they are they just drive me mad and and, and anyone that sort of you know has some sort of screen presence is lance henriksen you know yeah and everyone else is kind of got the guy from train spotting in this just playing this kind of like idiot you know who has uh everyone seems to be talking about their families throughout this and um and the, the beauty of trying to capture the look of aliens in this is hazard tape 
Right, this whole scene here is like like aliens. There's hazard tape everywhere. So in this film, they sort of <laughs> place hazard tape everywhere to make it look a bit like aliens, even though yeah. it's not. In, it's set in the past, you know. I, t- I saw there's a bit in the documentary where, in fact, you can see it here: the yellow and black chevrons, like surfaces everywhere. There was yeah. a, there's a bit in the video, and there's a shot of a guy with a, just a wall full of stuff leaning up against the wall, just painting. Just painting, painting, painting. And he says, it's going to be there for days. That's his job on this project, is just painting. Well, they shot this in Prague, which is where they shot Resident Evil, the first one. So they it's they, they come up with the idea that, oh, it's got, you know, it's, it can capture the sort of the coldness of Antarctica. So it's like, no, mate, it's just cheap. Yes. You know, <laughs> it's really cheap. <laughs> That's why you managed to pull this off for like a, you know, a, a medium sized budget for the time. Well, he made, uh, he's famously he said, didn't he, Paul W.S. Anderson, that the the set, um, in fact, all the sets were built in Prague for two million dollars, and he reckoned if he tried to do it in in L.A., it'd have been twenty. It's it's, it's good it's, it's good filmmaking. That's you know, you've got to be business savvy, haven't you, to do this? But stuff. It, it does make it feel slightly cheap somehow, though, because all of his movies have the same feel, or most of them anyway. To me, anyway, they feel like B movies. They feel like mm. um. Like the, everything was limited. It feels like the money's been used really well, rather than there was all the money in the world. Yes, and it always feels like every actor is the second choice. <laughs> in, apart from Lance <laughs> Henriksen, you always get the feeling he would, that he would do anything. He would turn up to anything, wouldn't he? He'd, he'd get, the, you know, he's always up for he's always up for working. He will literally appear in anything. <laughs> but it feels like that they, they've kind of gone. Well, we need a. Uh, a, a Brad Pitt type. We're mm. not going to try and get Brad Pitt. We need a Brad Pitt. Everyone feels like a type, like the, they're yes. a, a cheap version of someone else. <laughs> the Poundland versions, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the main character I only read this morning. Um, the main character, um, her, Sanar. I think her, Sanar Lathan. I think her name is Alexia. Was it uh, Alexa? Uh, Alexia? Alexa Woods. or Lex Alexia. In, in the movie? Yeah, Woods. Yeah. It was. They originally cast Queen Latifah. Really? For that role, and allegedly, um, she had to pull out due to scheduling conflicts, which would explain why, because she was cast um, like right at the last minute, wasn't she, Sana Lathan? So I wonder if that's why. It's interesting the making of where Paul says, oh, we need to find someone who's just as good as Scorny Weaver, just as sexy, <laughs> and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, right, I don't... But also, she clearly wasn't the first choice, you know. Okay, yeah, um, let's go with Poundland Halle Berry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and the, the other gentleman, which is, obviously we, we see at the beginning, we find the Pepsi um, cap for the bottle, and which looks like a deleted scene from Stargate. Um, <laughs> Raoul Bover, I think his name is. Yeah, his English is English is you know he speaks a good English, but I mean the way he delivers it, it feels so it feels like he's dubbed, but he's not dubbed. We see him in interviews; he's exactly the same in his inflections, how he talks. The yeah. thing is he spent the entire film sounding like he's been dubbed, but he's not. And uh, I don't know, he's he's old casting as well. Um, yeah, it all just seems like really kind of just gone. Yeah, just cast anyone, <laughs> just get with anyone who delivers a somewhat good performance, put him in a movie. Except, which is strange because we're in an ensemble like this. The chemistry between everyone is even more more important. Surely, it's, vital. It's, it's really strange to think that they cast the lead character of this movie clearly, you know, at the, literally a week before shooting start which means they can't have tested her alongside any of the other character any of the other actors nope. and there is just no uh, sense of chemistry is there of, of cohesive even amongst the subgroups because you've got like the mercenaries and you've got the the, the drillers and you've got the experts as well even mm. even in those subgroups there's no sense of chemistry or anything no this is this is great i love i love that ship that <laughs> model ship's fantastic Oh yes, great stuff. He has to use miniatures in this, which is good. Also, the effects by um, John Bruno, who uh, directed Virus. You know, one of the sort of must well, be one of the best up there as one of the best FX supervisors. So in this movie, the, the visual effects are surprisingly very good for their digital uh, kind of material. On the whole, yeah, yeah, I, I do like that. That that icebreaker ship is a model, mm. though, which I, I think just looks fabulous. As you were saying about the sort of Paul's films all take on a familiar look. If you look at like Resident Evil and then some of the other movies outside of this, they've always got. He shoots on Super 35, and 
and there's moments in this where the photography is really good, um, but it's also things seem quite flat. Mm. And don't seem an overly kind of sharp in areas where they've kind of been hot. I don't know where, in terms of the grading or they've kind of sucked the color out of it. Obviously, with this stuff, they've kind of messed with the colors to make it seem more. It's like cold and steely. Yeah, it's and, very desaturated, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, which is obviously a thing at the time, which they were doing a lot of movies. Um, I think. I mean, at the end of the day, the faster you shoot, the simpler your lighting design has to be. And yeah. that scene there, I mean, it didn't look like a TV show quite, but it wasn't far off. I think well, it, the room seemed empty. Yeah, you know, it's, it's there's obviously very sort of in some of these sort of areas, very limited set design or uh, set decoration. Um, I love this, all this nonsense about the hunter's mood and stuff. It's all just like trying to throw in the. It's all teeing up why things are going to go wrong for them. Yeah. But it's it's interesting with the producer John Davis, who had produced the first Predator film along with like uh, Joel Silver and I think some other gentlemen. Also, he produced tons of movies, and he's also um, he took him as you were mentioning earlier about the number of producers involved with Alien, who owns what. Um, he has to wrangle all that to get this to work. Um, I think most of them probably signed it off by saying, oh, yeah, we can get some money out of this. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> but even by come Prometheus, you know, even though Ridley makes nods to uh, the producers by naming them in the film uh, with some of the characters, it's like a, it's, they had no involvement with Prometheus. So yeah, it's, 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 this, this is it, isn't it? When you, when you get a, a, a property like this, anyone who's had a significant hand in it in the past needs a credit and, probably need to pay out as well. For, yeah, I mean, in the, for the same reason that Dan O'Bannon and Ron Chousset are credited as writers Yeah, on, on this, which is like... Because it, it, it still says, it's a screen story by them. Yeah. So I've always kind of been baffled, what, what did they actually write an initial draft of this? Or is this all just, I'm, I swear this is all just Paul W. Anderson. Yeah, no, I think, well, I mean, well, the story is pretty much that was very similar to the comic, isn't it? The original comic. But in terms of the screenplay, I, as far as I can tell, Anderson's the only one who wrote it. I've never come across any mention of Ron Chisette or Dan O'Bannon having mm. any kind of hand in it. And in fact, it's when they, when they are mentioned, it's as needing to be credited because they came up with the original concept. But, in, you know, to credit, I went really deep on when I made those Alien videos on the origin of Alien and exactly where each individual idea and concept came from, who came up with it. And to be honest, Dan O'Bannon may be Alien's father, but he didn't really, not much of his, not many of his final ideas ended up in the movie. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you, you refer, yeah, you mentioned that to me. We were in the pub a few months back and um, I think the chest, also chest burst is kind of, uh, one of that's Ron Chousset. Yeah. So that's, so the idea of the chest burster is, obviously key to all this and it's probably the only unique idea mm. from them that's in the, you know because so much of alien is fairly generic if we're honest it's the presentation and so on that makes it special do you think that sort of stems the original idea of alien sort of stems from an extension of dark star we you know the sort of uh... that was his idea for the star yeah he, he basically he wanted to make a, a comedy version of dark star and decided that the plot the you know the basic framework should be the uh, the the thing from another world was you know a fairly classic alien on a spaceship trying to kill people and in in a way alien is just the thing from another world with the chestburster idea added on with this idea of rape added on yeah yeah oh we got the uh, the uh, use of the, the the little line about condoms <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, I mean, do you remember Event Horizon? Because they always pulled up with Sanders and always said, "Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a cut which is far more graphic and and disturbing." And um, I think what came of that was not really much more. Um, and he's he does talk about stuff and doesn't often deliver. Where obviously the case with this before its DVD release, they were like, "There's an unrated version which we're watching or a director's cut," which is like everyone pres presumed it was really graphic. Where a lot of filmmakers, in the case of like Robocop, where they make everything really graphic. I think mm -hmm. just dial it back in the edit to to appease the MPAA, and we thought the same with this. I even thought that the, the case with Robocop three as a kid, there must be a more violent version of this film. And then my friend <laughs> sent me the script and he was like, is there, "Is there any more violence in the film?" He's like, "No, no." <laughs> so what they shot is what they shot. But in the case of this, I thought there's going to be far more graphic, and it isn't. It was just like a little bit here and there where it's, you could you could argue that you know 
uh, that would upset the the ratings board. But I think it's it's very tame. And again, when we've gone from Predator Two, you know, for example, which is you know overly violent, um, even the first one when the guy gets his spine pulled out and you got yeah, yeah. and the alien films themselves are always they're not they're not tamed down for children. No, the cadavers hanging from the tree as well in the in the first Predator movie they really yeah. stayed with me as a child. Oh yeah, for sure. And because uh, I'd always seen the first version of Predator as, as a cut version, I, my friend taped it off Sky Movies. It was uncut, so seeing all these other graphic bits was like, oh my god, you know. Um, so he comes to this. Is they they kind of went in knowing their audience are going to be teenagers who like playing video games and reading comics, and that was they're not going to risk it by making it an eighteen. But they made a movie which is fifty million roughly, uh, and they could if that was an eighteen, that would still have done well. I I, I don't really understand the sort of logic behind. Uh, Sort of the yeah. cutting back on the violence, you know. I, I certainly don't understand the logic of filming it the way they did because Anderson has. Because a rumor went around, I remember years ago, that there was some crazy hardcore version of mm. AVP that hadn't yet been released and, and the studio had forced Anderson not to talk about it or something. But I think that turned out to be um, apocryphal. And the in, in fact, what happened was Anderson has said in an interview that I read the other day that he, this is what he shot. He shot it as a PG-13. It was never intended to be anything else. And when he made the um, the uncut version for home video, they you know they egged it up as much as they could, but they just didn't have much to work with. And that's the weird thing. Yeah, what, what, like, even if you are scared about releasing uh, an R-rated or 18 movie in theatres, there's no reason not to... You know, shoot the stuff for the hardcore home video version that you know fans are going to want to watch. Yeah, that would have really like a boost of sales. I'm sure this obviously pretty sold well anyway. I think a lot of my friends own this movie, despite sort of poo pooing it when it came out. You just bought it anyway. But I suppose it's the same mentality he had shooting this with Mortal Kombat, which Mortal Kombat had a lot of fatalities in the game, and they weren't going to do that for a movie. So that was shot for a PG-13 mentality, and this was and and it, I you know. Business-wise and logically, it would make sense for them to get Paul to do exactly the same thing with uh, AVP. Obviously, they they correct you know they went on to, to correct their sort of mistakes with this with the sequel, which was yeah so dark you can't see what's happening, but yeah. it was really graphic. And in one shot with the ladies in the hospital who gets impregnated by the pred alien, really really bad taste you know of stuff, and uh, they went too far with it. I think there's there's a fine balance. I think yeah. I've I've never gone back and rewatched that uh, AVP Requiem, I think it's called, isn't it? I I absolutely hated that film when I saw it. <laughs> Which, I should probably give it another go because I hated this when I first saw it as well. I, I was very much in a world of Paul W S Anderson makes crap, and I hate everything he does. And he was one of my least favorite filmmakers at the time. <gasps> and for some reason, I ended up developing a real second wind for stupid <laughs> B movies, and came to the conclusion actually this is great. <laughs> This man's a god. <laughs> <laughs> but Requiem, yeah, because I, 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 that was that played when I was still a projectionist, and we watching it in thirty five millimeter on a massive screen. I still couldn't see anything. So yeah. that film needs a whole new regrade if they were going to, you know, do anything with it. But I mean, no one cares about that movie. It's just so naff as well. There was a, I, I, I flipped through it looking for clips for the Alien video I did, and. I, I just completely randomly landed on a scene where where the woman tell, says to the man, now the man says, um, get to the chopper. And the woman says, come on, Dallas, in response. And it's, oh my God, you, in the space of five seconds, you've just done two of the clumsiest flashback references I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, I, I must say the Predator, though, in that sequel is really good. You know, he's basically just cleaning up their... Cleaning up the mess, you know. Yeah, I think he, it's a good performance of the because it's the same actor, isn't it? In the in the suit in the second one, um, who plays all three of the predators in this one. I, don't, I can't remember his name. He's a the, the, basketball player. Yeah, he um, well, he went on to play the uh, the engineer in Prometheus. Oh yes, of course. Which yeah, is, which is perfect because he's ginormous and muscly. But the biggest mistake with this film is that they made the predators really muscly and big and bulky, and they can barely mm. move in the suits. And you see, you see him turn up. They're just like huge, like action figures. But the Predator was always very lean, wasn't he? He's very tall and yeah. thin, um, and that's what made him made it, made it kind of work. But when they've got them all buff, it's oh, it's silly. I think Paul just got a bit carried away. 
you can see the conversation that led to that as well, can't you? This, these things have to be convincing, fighting the uh, you know the, the xenomorph aliens. So let's make them more scary. Yeah, and it was always kind of the uh, the thing that uh, that the predators. What, what I think what frustrated me at the time was that the predators do get killed off very quickly. The other two. Yeah, yeah, that was a big problem for a lot of people. I remember that. Because and I know them, their their mission, their goal is to get the laser cannons, but obviously the, the humans are taking it, so it interrupts their mission. So they're kind of weakened in that regard. But the predator will still be able to stand up against an alien, I think, without the plasma cannon. Yeah, and you I know. see. I saw Anderson explaining this in an interview and saying, "Yeah, well, the reason it is that they were distracted by the humans; they weren't expecting them to be there." Mm. And I said, that is a that is a crap excuse. That is a really really weak explanation. <laughs> I love all the. I do like the sort of production design of this movie. I'm with the, the interior of the the Predator ship, even though it's kind of more glossy and metallic. I think in there is very different to what we saw in Predator Two, which has this kind of, you know, this kind of hieroglyphs or something. These patterns on the wall. It's very orange mm. and in fact, it's a very sort of uh, warm look to it, which they do carry over into the sequel with the the where they actually show you the Predator homeworld, glimpses of it, which I thought was actually it, it kind of stood up. To what it, what I kind of perceived it would look like, but um, mm. it's um, they all suit, they all suit up and stuff, and everything's kind of over the top. Like the predator claw is now like instead of being this kind of maybe a couple, well, half a meter in length is now like a yeah. meter or two. You know, it does feel like everything's been tweaked to make it a bit more schlocky. To make it a, <laughs> a bit like I was thinking this about the um, the life cycle of the alien once the um, uh, face huggers implanted the chest burster it it like it, it just takes it takes as long as the movie needs it to to then burst out it, it like, whereas yeah you think you know that it was clearly established that there is an actual you know biological process taking place here and so on and so on and it's, but it's that's what you want from I mean, it's a more schlocky movie it's 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 skewed differently this movie it's not aimed at exactly the same audience as the previous two yeah Exactly. I, I, there was kind of theories thrown around that the sort of the the alien kind of face or the face huggers, the eggs themselves, have a sort of quicker process of generating to sort of inside one's body. But that's just kind of it's not explained in the movie. It means it's kind of incorrect because, as you say, there's, there's time for it to, to develop. And in the third one, obviously, she Ripley's getting medicine to sort of help her, delaying the process of this queen being born. Um, but in this, it's like it's all down to the convenience of the plot. Yeah. You know? So. It is a fantastic idea, though. I mean, it's the, that's where this, the, my love for this film begins, but certainly doesn't mm. end. Is the, <laughs> uh, the 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 concept which comes from the the comic, the idea of the which I mean, I've not read. You must know better than me. But essentially, the idea of holding uh, a an alien queen hostage, using it to produce eggs, using those eggs to then create more aliens which are then used to essentially test a young predator's skill and transition him to manhood you know they have to go and hunt these that is such a brilliant idea and executed here i think really well because the idea the setting putting it here in this icy environment achieves so many clever things you know you, you couldn't it wouldn't make this wouldn't work in in a jungle and it wouldn't work in a city where the two previous predator movies took place mm. it needs to be a really hostile environment it needs to be a, an environment that will kill you it needs to be an alien looking environment and of course for practical reasons nobody can ever know that this happened because yeah according to the timeline people you know wayland knows about the alien xenomorphs but the general world doesn't so it couldn't have happened in the public so it, it, it's it's really quite cleverly contrived in that way, I think. Anyway. Mm. Oh yeah, I, I don't I don't fault uh, Paul's kind of idea on this. I think it is. I think it's, it's the best approach you could go with it. Mm. Um, if, if you're going to be setting it on Earth in particular, because in the comics it was set on like another planet where it's in the future and these people are sort of just landed on this planet, I believe, and there's already this kind of thing set up where the predators are kind of breeding these aliens. Um, but I think the idea that they have the heat source underneath Antarctica, and they find this kind of like Aztec type building. And it's always kind of the the idea that people probably like to think that there is something maybe buried under Antarctica, where yeah, it, you know, where the millions of years ago, where the Earth's crust all separated, and um, or the you know the 
parts of the different countries and formed Antarctica. But uh, there's something maybe there. But that's actually based on a on a true story. I don't know how true it, you want to place it, but mm. allegedly um, th- there was. Uh, I can't remember when it was, but th- someone, some satellite did pick up some crazy um, heat flash in an area like this, somewhere off the coast of Antarctica, somewhere in the, in Antarctica. And no one's ever been able to figure out what it is, but it, it's a fact that, it, that the satellite picked it up, and yeah. apparently that's what that's what sort of sparked this idea. Fantastic. I don't understand it. It's also good. another thing it does well is it. It's really hard to give the human characters any kind of agency or purpose in a movie that's about two, you know, vastly superior aliens fighting each other. Yeah, and the way they incorporate Lex's character—I mean, most of these people are just fodder to kill off, aren't they? But the way Lex is actually given something to do is quite convincing. I think that that works really quite well. I think that comes from the comic as well. She's kind of like health and safety. <laughs> She's been deployed <laughs> for you know what I mean. And well, actually, another thing that really annoyed me actually with this movie at the time was the score, um, because it doesn't reference those themes by Jerry Goldsmith, James Horner, Alec Goldenthal, and Silvestri, you know, yeah. there's nothing there to sort of uh, really sort of give you a sort of nod to these films, which I would do really logically, even now, if, if it's kind of a sort of soft reboot or if it is a sequel, then those themes are kind of utilised, not often uh, in the most obvious way, but they just use it as a little kind of motif where yeah. they're, kind of, they're kind of scared to actually use it properly. Uh, this is composer but Howard Closure. I can't remember his name, but he works with uh, Roland Emmerich, so he's mm. been scoring all of his movies since David Arnold separated ways from Roland Emmerich. I think after the Patriot, um, no Patriot, that was John Williams actually. So maybe the last one was um, Godzilla that David Arnold had composed, but uh, yeah, the score just did nothing for me. You know, yeah. it's a bit of a shame. If I'm if I'm entirely honest, the score to the original Alien has never really done an awful lot for me. It's, it's atmospheric and it's perfect in the moment, but there's nothing memorable about it to me. It's never really. You don't think that the opening titles really sort of do much I, for you? For some reason, and I know I'm the oddball here. I, everyone I've ever talked to this about disagrees mm. profoundly. <laughs> I, I disagree profoundly. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think I'm I'm not that. I don't think I'm quite as aware of uh, scores in films as most people. Uh, it's, right. It, it, if, it, as long as it's, you know, achieving the emotional effect it's meant to, I, I can quite easily not notice a melody or, or whatever. Oh, but I, I don't know. right. There's um. Well, that's it. Well, I remember one little bit of trivia at the time was like I think Paul had said in an interview that James Cameron's only comment on this at the time when he's making it was get the Alien Queen right. You know, and he does. It looks amazing, right? Yeah. When it when she cracks out of the ice and she's like roars, and you got the lighting behind her, it's very, very reminiscent of like this. looks like aliens. Yeah, it's just like aliens. This is pure fan service. This oh, yeah. sequence, and it works too. It's completely justified. It's completely effective. It looks amazing. Yeah. And again, apparently, this image is copied almost exactly from the comic books. Oh wow. I've got, I've got the book. I've got like these volumes they they put out. Dark Horse did. They're really expensive now. I wish I I did give a couple away to friends. I think I should have kept them. <laughs> worth like a hundred pounds each. I, I still I still got another set of them. But yeah, I should have kept them. See, this is the kind of stuff which is why why I like this movie because I'm a complete sucker for. Any kind of uh, a limited cast in an enclosed environment facing a threat, that's, I'll, I'll watch anything like that. And <laughs> Although there's no real chemistry between these actors, it, it still works on that level somehow. It works on the level in terms of what you like about that idea, right? mm. like in terms of enclosed environment and, they get, and they're just getting surrounded. Uh, but in terms of what I would want, from this franchise <laughs> are characters that I really like are cool because when like Bill Paxton gets dragged under in Aliens you don't want him to die you love Bill you know yeah. you don't want him to die 
And it's like, even like Michael Bean, it's like, you know, you don't want him to get hurt and he just gets, gets the acid on his face. And in Vasquez, you know, you, you don't, you know, you want them to survive. And um, and that's the kind of endearing thing about, about those movies to me. And it's and it's, a, it's an issue with horror films in general is that they often create these characters who are just there as fodder for the yeah, monster he- to kill off. Um, you're absolutely right. It's a really good point, actually. That a really major failing of this film. The only character you actually want to survive is probably Lance Henriksen. And yeah. <laughs> you, you know from his introduction that he's not going to. <laughs> you know, even if he wasn't about to end, find himself in Antarctica with aliens and predators, the guy can't even breathe. <laughs> no. <laughs> Here we go. We've got the uh, predator attacking in camouflage. See, in a video game, he'd be cheating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He wouldn't get, get the points. <laughs> that's that's a good reveal, though. You know, the spear yeah. appears out of the camouflage. I didn't know if the spear was ever camouflaged. You know, in the films, it was always like, if you... Predator 2, where he fires the net, you see the, the weapon yes. at the end of his arm to sort of show you what it is. Yeah, I'm not buying that. That doesn't make a lot of... Because Predators aren't... They don't have all the technology in the world, do they? Their, their technology is relatable. Yes, it's, you know when he when the predator wants to go invisible, he's got to press a button, I think, to do it, and it's yeah. things like this. But yeah, it, based on the science, we understand that doesn't make any sense at all. And the heat vision doesn't look as good either. They've, 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 it's, it looks completely different to what we'd seen before. Um, like it was this kind of analog video. Yeah, look to the heat it was a classic representation of what you'd represent as the heat of someone, you know, uh, or of the environment. And this is all just kind of weird reddish color. So, yeah. yeah, I didn't like that. It really pops. Yeah, because it's kind of a, a lower, much lower resolution than the real yeah. image as well. And it really pops because they've drained all the colour out of this, haven't they? It's, mm. it's almost monochrome at times. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Is that Predator? It's just too buff. Way too buff. It's, like, it's just like there's literally got wrestlers in there. You know? I don't, there probably is a theory, though, that you could apply to that, which is that the Predator we know is the one that hunts humans and according to their mythology it's mm. it's much younger predators who are who hunt humans that's that's an early stage of your your sort of your path to manhood mm. whereas this is the final stage apparently so these predators are older than right. the ones we we've already seen so i guess you you could argue that there's a reason for it whether or not it, it's it's a good idea is another matter if it's explained in like the comics or there's a reason yeah. why the difference i'm like I can, you've got a perfectly fair argument there <laughs> yeah no, i'm scrounging around here <laughs> yeah cause the problem is like because we all love these kind of movies right but when there's things aren't explained properly you sort of fill in the gaps yourself and that's the kind of the case with like the history of the alien when they did prometheus and alien covenant and they kind of messed things around people got very annoyed but you know if you go back to alien things aren't explained it's all down to like it just gives you imagery and you fill in the blanks and whatever yeah. and a lot of people filled in the blanks and it kind of all came to a very similar conclusion but when you saw it actually executed in a sequel or a prequel sorry it's not what you expected you know yeah. so that's that's the frustration i think it's often when you leave things up to the audience it's actually often a little bit more exciting because then you after the film you can talk to your friends about it and you know and come up with your own ideas and it's like yeah yeah there's gaps and there's gaps as well there are gaps that that seem to contradict what we already know and there are gaps that just don't have an explanation that's and fine. If the once second they gap. contradict, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the second one's fine, and but also, Aliens a really simple film, and it, it's not laden down or weighed down with uh, existing mythology and so on. I suppose when they came to make this, they had all these things, all these booby traps that they could have fallen into, and generally did, which the previous filmmakers maybe didn't have so much because there just wasn't so much mythology, there wasn't so much fact, there wasn't so much assumption amongst the audience as well yeah i think that they know the audience going to this kind of know the backstory they know the basics yeah and that's what they're going to give you the basics they're not going to go too far into just trying to explore anything else because all you're there for is just them to sort of have a fight which they did which i, I think they released like the, the main fight that you see like the proper big fight you see at the beginning of the film where the predator takes on the alien swings him by his tail and throws him down the corridor I think they put that online, you know, before, like, doing the film's promotions. You kind of see, like, yeah. one of the big elements. That's a good shot. That's a really good shot, looking down. that's And somehow it's very Paul Anderson as well. I can't 
quite nail down what it is that makes his films all kind of look the same. <laughs> and I don't mean that as a criticism either. I kind of there's something they're quite they look cheap. <laughs> they look they look cheap but well done. They look like they look like someone's really tried to make the most of not an awful lot of money, which I think sometimes isn't actually what's happening. It's he's actually just making quite a lot of money look quite cheap. But it there's there's something very um sort of rigid and defined and I don't know. Do you think they feel they feel very sort of storyboarded? You know, there's no the shots don't the sh- shots don't have a sense of that they're being creative on the day to try and try something different. It's just like this is what it looks like. Shoot that. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a certain contrived and specific nature to everything. Very workmanlike, perhaps. Yeah, you know, with its execution. Yeah, yeah. If yeah, which goes back to the lighting, I think, and and the fact that he's that he can produce these movies quickly and cheaply. Generally speaking, mm. it's you know that. Uh, you're going to have to do things quickly. You're going to have to make quick decisions. And <laughs> here we go. A big conveyor belt. They've got all these alien eggs. It's great. <laughs> I mean, it looks just like how it was supposed to. I mean, you got you got Studio ADI on this. You know, Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. in playing Tom playing the alien again. He's, I think he was the alien in number three and four. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, same the same guy with the same hand laying yeah. the same yeah. <clears throat> I love there's a, there's a hilarious Bruno Mattei movie called Zombies Two: The Beginning, which is just aliens. It's an ex- it's a shot for shot remake of Aliens. It's <laughs> unbelievable. The only difference is they're zombies. Well, okay. Of course, he still has to do the scene where the alien queen is laying eggs from this, so he just does it anyway. It's just, it just makes no sense whatsoever. But now every time I see an alien queen laying an egg, I think of that stupid film. <laughs> You're thinking of the wrong film now, aren't you? <laughs> I do like this moment here, when because the predator appears, and he, he, there's a quick slash, and it cuts to the, the blood spraying on the on the, on the the snow. It's just, it's just a good edit, you know. Mm. That's, that's good. Whoa, <laughs> that's a lot of blood, too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll move along, everyone. It sort of becomes this kind of weird. I think it starts closing off, like creating new areas, which is very clever, actually. I think yeah. it's just a sort of crystal maze. I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what it's like, isn't it? Yeah, it's. it's... <laughs> Kim Richard O'Brien just running around, <laughs> <laughs> firing out some weird jokes. That would be, I mean, be a great concept for even for a video game, because every time you play it, if the map changes, every time you play it, every, your experience will always be different. Yeah. yeah that would be... And there's, there's got to be a way of utilising this, because these escape rooms have become huge now, haven't they, as an industry? That mm. I, I've, I keep thinking, and my daughter goes and does them from time to time, and I keep thinking, why don't they do movie-themed ones? There are so many great movies with these environments. Did you, did you go to Alien War in the early 90s? No. Oh, oh. Could you? I always no. thought. Okay, you're around that sort of area. You should. You, I thought you would have gone to Alien War. I mean, that, that's no, my. A couple of my friends went when they were like eight years old, and so it was terrifying. What? What? I don't even know what it is. Well, basically, in the Trocadero, they had a. Uh, a they constructed a set. Basically, looks like uh, the set from Aliens, where you know you've got the where all the humans were, and they get taken away, and it's the sort of the corridors, you know, of the uh, of the the station they built. Yeah. On it, right? And people just walk around these sets, you get chased by aliens. Oh, wow. I didn't know. I didn't know about that. My God, Rob. Yeah, it was. It, it, it lasted, I think it lasted a couple of years, but I think because the, 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 it was underground at Chocadero, it got flooded. Oh, yeah. So they didn't really bother to repair it. But I think it started out in, in Scotland. They did a test and they did really well and they brought it down to Chocadero. So you had, in the early 90s, you had Chocadero in a Virgin Cinema. Then from like 95, you had Sega World in there. So Chocadero was the hub. Of entertainment, you know, in London, we were amazing. <laughs> amazing it? it would be amazing, you know. When I was working in in uh, post production, I was obviously just a few yards away from the Trocadero, and I'd go in there from time to time. But man, it was just a toilet. It was <laughs> uh, such a great space. But for about two years, all they did with it was have one of those um, trampolines that they tie you to. 
Oh, so right, you, yes. Uh, it's, it was just, it was always a ghost town. It was right in the middle of Piccadilly yeah. Circus, this yeah. enormous ghost town just sitting there. That was, when was that from, like 99 or 2000? Or that was uh, the, from, yeah, like the, the 2000s. Oh, yeah, so like late 90s is kind of when it all went downhill. So yeah, after Sega just World after that, left. yeah. Oh, dude, if you like their mid, if you like 96, 95, it would have been absolutely amazing. <laughs> oh, dear. I, I, I do like that they've kind of, you know, made an attempt to really make a detailed shoulder cannon. Because obviously in the first one, it looks like a bit like a hairdryer mm. attachment. In the second one, it's kind of a little bit improved as well. And it, it's weirdly, like, a lot of the stuff from Predator 2 gets carried over in, in a lot of the video games and the comics, where it's got the net, it's got the disc, it's got um, the extension of the spear as well. Mm. So there's a lot more stuff they play with. It's a bit like when you see Conan the Destroyer, a lot of the sort of visual elements in that sort of make its way into other movies and and um, print media and things like that, where it's going to pulled ideas from it, where less so than the first one. Mm. Um, because it's obviously a lot more colourful, a lot more kind of fantasy-based sequels are um i love it she's grill- grilling them on not taking the guns we haven't <laughs> signed, signed the release forms or we haven't signed the you know the health and safety we haven't checked this place out yet you're not having that gun he's like fuck this well that gentleman there the the, the guy who's in the bond films and um, the black guy can't remember his name now colin oh. salmon that's it that's it because he was like at one point touted to be james bond because he's very He's got the sort of very posh accent, and you know, and uh, he's in Resident Evil One, yeah, he's in this, and maybe something else. Paul W. Sanderson made. I have to double check that. He's good in Resident Evil. He's good in this actually. I, I kind of like him. He's good. He's, he's a good actor. He just doesn't quite get his dues really with them. Um, my baby being in a couple of, kind of duffer movies, I suppose. Critically, well, yeah, and he's never. I don't know that I've not seen him play the kind of role that you could really have a lot of fun with as well. I can, yeah, I can. James Bond. I think he. would He'd have to change his approach a bit, but he, there's no reason why he couldn't do it. Yeah, because he was like a in James Bond, he's one of those MI5 or whatever it is agents, MFI. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he he dies in um, Resident Evil. He dies with uh, by the. Do you remember his death in Resident yeah, Evil? Yeah, the laser, the, the the laser grid cuts. Through. And he very nearly dies in exactly the same way in this, doesn't he? Because he yeah, gets the net, net shot at him. That. Yes, yeah, right. That was a very good moment in Resident Evil where it cuts through him and then as the camera sort of focuses on the background, in the foreground you see his eye kind of melt as he's yeah. being cut. It's, it's very good. Is it, How many times have we seen that kind of shot where someone gets beheaded but they for the first few seconds they're trying to figure out what's happened and then their head <laughs> falls off or they, they fall into or something. And it's, I love, it's, it's pure Paul Anderson that when he does it, it's, it's an absolute... Mash grid of gore and blood, and oh, it's ridiculously over the top. He's throwing this giant like salad strainer at them, you know. Like, cut There's a moment when he's trying to figure out what's just happened to him, and then he realizes, oh yes, he's been cut into a thousand pieces. <laughs> oh my, my friends all just went oh when I saw the face again. It speed ramps. It sort of slows yeah. down. And goes yeah. and goes towards them. It's like oh fuck off. <laughs> That's not aged well, has it? That speed ramping stuff. No, that's something, that's something you deploy in a trailer, not in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck you. <laughs> oh, it's great. Because weirdly, a minute, a minute ago when we saw the 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 victims get hit by the face huggers, there's a cut to one guy who we've barely seen. It just shows you that you, you've, they've introduced too many characters to this team who don't get any screen time to be introduced and say who they are. And just just, just this guy there, you know. Yeah. In Prometheus, you've got that similar issue, but they at least they give you sort of time for these characters to essentially have some screen time, even though it's maybe limited. At least they you get to know who they are. And well, that one guy just goes, I just like rocks. That's all I like. You know? <laughs> No, you're absolutely right. And you know they're only there to get killed as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, now I think about it, why is uh, Lex, that uh, the lady lead, why is she in charge? I don't know. I think it's just literally like we need another Ripley. Mm. That is it. And is someone in charge. And, and it's also it's demographic. You've got to make sure you've got the right number of people who are going to be ones you know to 
sort of tick the checklist of have someone maybe Asian, have someone who's maybe um, African American or whatever, you know, and that's the sort of the tick box. Uh, and it, she does she's not written to be like someone who can do everything, no, and not be like the sort of the, the term they will use the, the Mary Sue thing where yeah. you have a an art you know have a character the Mary Sue things always come from like the art the author injecting themselves into the story but now it's kind yeah. of been woven into someone who can basically do everything without any with like little effort you know or there's no struggle with their character very much like you know people refer to as you know Ray in the Star Wars yeah. new sequels but that, that all stems from for me Paul Anderson already did that and abused that in the Resident Evil movies with Mila Djokovic you know mm. she's like indestructible she can do yeah. anything with no effort whatsoever I mean, the case of this, you know, uh, Lex, you know, she does have, she's not written to be like that, I don't think. I, d- I never got that impression. It's, it's strange, because it would, in this case anyway, it would have at least explained why Wayland puts her in charge, because I don't think you're in a hostile environment with killer aliens trying to get you. Mm. And he, he's, oh yeah, that, that, that grumpy mountaineer, let's put her in charge. Not the commandos, who are heavily armed. And yeah. trained to deal with exactly these scenarios, will put in charge the woman who's good at climbing up mountains. Yeah, and they're, they're not in a mountain at the moment. You're in a bill, you know. Well, it's something she can probably climb something like. Well, exactly. Yeah, no. It's, it, I, I get her supervising the journey there. Mm. But I'm. I, I want Colin Salmon in charge now. Frankly, Def- if I'm part of that group. Yeah. yeah. Because if they've been in hostile vi- environments before, then it makes sense, right? And uh, oh, this moment here because it's obviously leading up because there's going to be a predator standing there. Watching them is camouflaged, or just kind of they don't are completely unaware of him because of all the other statues. <laughs> this was so he jumps across when everything kicks off, he jumps across from one side to another, but in very slow manner. It's like he's literally on wires, just getting pulled across <laughs> as he goes invisible. <laughs> oh, that's good. That is, yeah, I like that. that that's clever, you know. So, that's the thing about Anderson. You can watch it, and, and the film will annoy you. But then he has flourishes of really good ideas. He does good death. He, he, he's good at killing people. <laughs> Event that should, horizon. That be the quote great for it. on the back of the Blu-ray or something. <laughs> In fact, I watched Mortal Kombat completely coincidentally just a week or so ago. My ten-year-old um, just got one of the games, and I said, "You know, there's a movie, and it's really stupid." <laughs> we stuck it on, and it. It, again, it's got, it's full of invention. It's full of great little ideas, neat little. Did, did he enjoy it though? Did he enjoy yeah, it? Yeah, he loved it. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a great bit in Mortal Kombat where they see the shadow of Goro, and Johnny Cage goes to Sonya. Sonya, you go ahead and find out what that was. Yeah. <laughs> Me and Lou will stay right here. <laughs> it's, like, it's really good humour. You, you know. see that that's again, it's a it's a small group of people who have to go to a, a dangerous place and try to survive, and they. They they just work much better than this bunch do. Yeah, because it's not written by Paul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good point. And the actors, yeah, actually, you think it does because Johnny Cage has some great dialogue. They're mm. so well defined. You know, Sonya oh, yeah. Blade, Johnny Cage, Liu Kang. Those three character types are so clear and work so well together. Definitely. Yeah, it's, it's I've forgotten how much. How many sort of how puzzle based it is, but even though it's it's showing you these moments where things are closing off and we still you still don't get a sense of how it's all constructed or like the geography of things. Maybe that's mm. on purpose to make it confusing for the 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 victims or the, you know the, the guys in the film. But because um, there's a lot of he shoots up a lot of wides and suddenly all the dialogue stuff is like all close ups, even mm. the action then where. Everything was kicking off. People were falling down and cowering in the corner, but it's all close-ups, so you get, you get no sense. It becomes a little bit disjointed and messy. Um, and the camera's always moving as well, well so often moving mm. that there was a shot just then which would have really could have been used to to serve to sort of help us orientate ourselves in this large room. But the camera's rotating because it's, it's you know it looks good, but it doesn't help us. And we've got some little bits coming up now when he puts his hand on the floor and it's just like the slime from the alien. It's saliva. These aliens are very dribbly, aren't they? It looks like, yeah. You know? well, it's, every film featuring an alien has to have a scene where someone stands on or, or gets the slime <laughs> dropped on them so they can look up. And <laughs> that shot there, I'm sure that was like a red herring. We were meant to assume that's when oh, the yeah. 
Oh, here we go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's just a straight reference to Alien, isn't it? Oh, of course. Yeah, with Dallas, isn't it? You know, mm. but at least you got to see Alien just go. The first one, he just does that <laughs> weird move and it cuts, but it works. But as a kid, that terrified me that bit because you've got the beep, 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 and it's gonna and it's closing in on him. But there's no sense of that there, so mm. it isn't scary. You know, that's yeah. Oh, the bit coming up when um, the alien captures um, Colin Salmon with the net and you see the spear go through him, but it's so poorly shot, you don't actually know what's going on. It always really, it really annoyed me because, again, it's a lot of it's covered in close-ups. It's like you often sort of... Yeah, people shoot really... in these formats, you know, two, three, five to one, and you're, you're shooting most of it in close-ups. Like, uh, do yeah, it? don't get me started on that. I've got such a... I've such a distaste for ultra widescreen formats. I just don't understand the point. <laughs> if you're not going to use the frame properly, then don't use it. Well, it's like the, the, the most the most visually accomplished filmmaker, in my opinion, of all time, is without a doubt Stanley Kubrick. Mm. And he only made two films in a format wider than our televisions: Spartacus and uh, two thousand and one. Two thousand one, yes. Yeah, and he always shot spherical. Yeah, every, every and in fact, even um, like um, right up until oh god, I can't remember where it changed now. But a lot of a lot of his fifties and sixties movies are, are shot like Doctor Strangelove is variable gate, and a lot of it's just four by three. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it's really strange. And it, Clockwork it, Orange, I think as well. In format yeah. jacket, it's more kind of yeah like the, one one three three. Think it yeah, the, the, yeah it, it, between that and one seven eight. Yeah. And his explanation for that was, well, that's, broadly speaking, what the human field of vision is. So why would you do anything else? But you, but you couldn't imagine, say, uh, a Star Wars film in 185. It had to be scope, you know. You just, I think there's an visually, argument, yeah. For, there's a visual storytelling element to that. that yeah, there, there are exceptions. Continuity. There are certainly exceptions. Westerns as well. Uh, uh, yeah, there are definitely exceptions. But on the whole... I think it's done for impact and because they can, but yeah, but off the time they are shooting pretty much. This, this is Super Thirty Five, so they basically shot this full frame, and then obviously with the what they're seeing on the on the VT monitor is this kind of grid to give them yeah. the two, three, five, one. So they're kind of still shooting open mat essentially, and yeah. just cropping it. So you end up with this kind of very grainy film, and they try to get the grain out of it because it's too grainy because they've zoomed in, and it ends up looking like this, kind of like a weird digital kind of look to it, I think. It does look digital, actually, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's down to the transfer, maybe. But. It, it's been so heavily graded as well. That I, I think yeah. that when this this sort of cyan wash that they love giving these kind of films it d- yeah. just makes everything look digital to me now. And it ends up being a shortcoming of the photography because he's not lit it like that way. It's just been altered in the picture. And when you see, you know, the first alien, it's lit that way. Obviously, it's been mm. graded chemically at the end but I mean there's it's not a huge I don't think there would be a huge difference you know in terms of what they shot and what they ended up with mm. with the grading um, it's, it's, any any process you apply to, to film any digital process makes it look less like film and mm. this is this has been graded to within an inch of its life and it just I don't know it's not it'd be interesting to see what the rushes look like you know what I mean? Mm. Before they graded it, you think, oh my god, that actually looks better. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. you know. <laughs> oh, that's another little <laughs> nod to the something else, isn't it? I think that's is that Alien 3, that shot? I can't yeah. remember now. Oh god. What is Ewan Bremner doing in this? I know. He's better when he's completely drugged up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? How are we supposed to care about any of these things? I know. Sorry, I'm the fan. I know. Yeah, this is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, You're joining my side now. Poor you and Bremner. <laughs> I was so invested in him. <laughs> I don't know. It is, it is kind of cool, though, the way that it. I, I mean, the build isn't exactly hugely involving. Mm. But when you spend half a movie waiting for something to happen and then shit just kicks off, it's yeah. always kind of cool. And, it, and, yeah. and this does do that. He does. Paul does give it time. You know, he's not. 
he's not going straight into it. You know, he says he's, he's, he's done what he's supposed to do. Is give it give it about a forty five minute wait. Yeah, and that's one of the things he talked about. I can't remember if it's in the documentary or the commentary or what, but he was saying how the, the beauty of Alien, Aliens, and Predator is that you get to spend the first half of the film with these characters, getting to know them, getting to care about them, getting to understand their interactions, and therefore when they start getting killed, it really matters to you. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, his idea works in theory, but the yeah, on paper, it's what he's done. Yeah. <laughs> so this part here, Rob, watch. Okay, like he's getting cut, then he sits, stab, goes to the wall, and he, his eyes close. We don't actually see him get. There's a weird shot of Henriksen trying to get up. You know, it, it's odd. Something must have been cut there. Yeah. But uh, having said that, there are some vagaries in this. I don't want to jump forward right to the end, but I'm assuming anyone listening to this will know the movie. But when the alien queen, spoiler, uh, is killed at the end, it, is, she, is it killed? Is she killed? It's not. It's, it not dragged, even... it's dragged into the water, isn't it? I don't think it's properly killed. But it, this is a good moment, though. This is like this is trailer fodder shot. It's yeah. you know, every lobby card would include this. Their yeah. two faces coming together, <laughs> and the music, you know, cues it all up, and it kills him. It's like <laughs> that. That really annoyed me. <laughs> yeah I, I've never I haven't really focused on this little sequence but that is ridiculous it's well shot though I, this, this is this is where they had to get it right the the fight between the Predator and Alien and it's mm. you know we're seeing a lot of close ups with the sort of in camera practical stuff then you sort of see the CG counterpart of the Alien when he gets thrown around which is which is quite funny when he's just like bashing it against a wall and stuff and it's nice the way the human characters are there to observe what's happening and for us to see their reaction to it and for their presence to be a supposedly, theoretically relatable threat. Something we should be worried and care about because obviously yeah. we're not particularly invested in the actual Predator or the actual alien. It's all very quick cutting, isn't it? Sort of high delimitations of a, a guy in a suit. Mm. And it falls down and rolls. That looks, that looks, yeah, I mean, that's weird. It looks like very, very Giga-like imagery. It is clearly a man in a suit, though, isn't it? And that's one thing that, particularly the first Alien, does unbelievably well. You, I, I, do, I just don't get a sense that the, the original Alien is a guy in a suit. Such quick cuts, isn't it? There's one amazing shot on the Alien where, where he's about to kill Lambert and you see him sort of slide across the screen. Do you remember that shot? Very slowly, near the end. It just kind of moves as it goes from left to right. It's like a really effective sequence. Yeah. So, but everything else is very quick cuts, isn't it? The sort of yeah. hide. Yeah, and yeah, and and not a lot of you know long shots of the whole thing, unless it's so far away you can't really. That's it. Throws it. <laughs> yeah, I'm betting that was in the trailer too. <laughs> oh yeah, you'll win. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Fatality. <laughs> also, special moves coming up now <laughs> through the acid. <laughs> Oh no, got the custard on me. Get it off. Uh, and I the predator's just like, oh, where's he gone? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, those dreadlocks were Stan Winston's idea. That's right, wasn't it? Yeah, and also the, the predator sort of <laughs> pussy face was kind of uh, the crab, th you know, tentacles was James Cameron's, wasn't it? Yeah, the yeah. Combination of stuff. I think they designed it over a pl on a plane journey, I think. I mean, it is the coolest looking beast, though, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, just it's the alien is still the scariest monster ever created for film, but I think the one that's kind of badass and cool is the Predator. You know, this, this, uh, nothing seems to have kind of topped those two. And it kind of yeah, you, you see like from a marketing perspective and sort of the interest of combining the two just seems such an easy kind of thing and that's why the comics did well and the games did well and you know. and led to a whole little little uh, little um range of these equally silly comics as well there's alien yeah. versus um that predator shot versus there, sorry the long shot that's oh, amazing yeah. that is great goals. yeah that was a that's a prometheus like shot somehow that is isn't it yeah 
Yeah, apparently there's a Alien versus Predator versus Judge Dredd comic. Oh which my god, I can't quite imagine. I've got Batman versus Predator. Uh. Batman. I think I think I've got the sequel comic. It's really good. They even did a Superman versus Predator, and I was going to buy it, but I flicked through it and the, the artwork, and it looked terrible. So I'm not mm. buying it. <laughs> what we need is Robocop. Robocop versus Predator. Yes. Which, I, which I've probably done. <laughs> We need Robocop via a lot more things, I reckon. I think so, yeah. People are still hoping out for Robocop versus Terminator. That that must be a rights nightmare. Well, actually, no. Well, maybe the first Terminator is owned by MGM, and so is Robocop. Which now owned by Amazon, so it could happen. Mm. You never know now. Oh, he's, he's also a little nod to the Predator 2, where, you know, when Predator 2, he can sense that the woman's pregnant, he won't hurt her. He just knows he's got an issue with his heart. I'm not going to leave him. Not a know. challenge, yeah. It's it's really good. Uh, uh, all this stuff really builds the culture of the Predator race. It also gives the Predator, the main hero Predator, a bit of character. Yeah. Because he can't speak. So. And that, and again, that's a real... Um, there's that bit at the end of Predator 2 where they respect Danny Glover and, you know, let him go or whatever. And that does more... That gives the, the Predator more... A, a deeper character than anything in the first film yeah and that's something they, they really go to town with here especially later once Lex has sort of proved herself to the surviving predator and it gives them so much more depth and relatability yeah and it also, it also gets the audience on the predator's side as well that was the worst bit of CG blood trickle I've ever seen out of Lance <laughs> Hendrickson's mouth then he's such an idiot his character Why the predator let him go and he goes right I'm just going to burn you plonker It's really, I've only just noticed the audio running down the side of that as well. Is that in the... Oh, it is in the original, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But it's like really... Because it's such a hard... Because the original one, it's like it was black with the colour of the person you saw with their heat. And then the red text would be like very obvious, you know, in the frame. That was very just sort of... Because it's a wide frame, you kind of have to look for that sort yeah. of stuff. It's not in your face straight away. This is very Indiana Jones, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that'd be awful! It's closing in quickly. Oh yeah, that's that's again. This is so Paul Anderson. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, that scene that could have happened in any Resident Evil movie. It could have happened in yeah. Event Horizon. It could have happened in Mortal Kombat. When he throws the disc or the thing down the thing, that was really good. Good direction. That's good lighting here as well. When they sort of, you know, you got the wide shot. Um, I know because in the making of Paul was like didn't like the original disc in the number two it looked like a frisbee mm. so let's kind of make it like a, like shur- a shuriken and that's a great shot as well I mean it's you know it's all stuff teenagers would just love yeah and Rob and there's nothing wrong with making this for <laughs> <laughs> funnily enough when I was a teenager I hated it <laughs> <laughs> never get things right as you said earlier where it's like the alien just got his head cut just like am I dead <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> so wait and see which bit of me falls off, then I'll decide. <laughs> oh, it's another little character moment, isn't it? Where it it it's adds to sort of burns, oh, yeah. you know. Say, like, I've killed one or two, whatever. And then it's yeah, refer- reference back really nicely at the end with when he he sort of bloods her, doesn't he? Yeah. Although I'm surprised the the face hugger counts as a proper kill in a way. Yeah, that's maybe he's maybe he's counting the one he killed a minute ago, the alien. Oh, good point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if the face huggers count, I'll just get loads of them. I've got loads of points. <laughs> Whole face is scarred. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now leader of the predator race. There's so much of this is someone looking, someone secretly watching someone else, isn't it? And mm. <laughs> behind there's the f- all these shots of seem to sort of so many shots that seem to pull back to reveal a predator that is actually watching the people, or the people are watching the predator. Yeah, I suppose it's through it's like the audience are sort of participating with the the human characters, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, I think I get the sense that was important to to Anderson, mm. and he does it all right. Yeah, yeah. 
I think that's the extent of what they can do, because unless they'll, they'll, just, they'll just be killed. So it just has to be observers of this kind of battle. Now they've got to figure out the sort of the puzzle, haven't they? Just sort of get out and get to the next level. I'm increasingly thinking it's the script and the casting that's the problem here. Mm. Two important things, though, Rob. Yeah, kind of <laughs> crucial in a way. <laughs> Far from that, it's great. <laughs> and the look, obviously, we're not happy with the lighting. And the... Yeah, there's moments where the lighting's great, other moments where it's just like very flat, isn't it? I, I kind of like these little moments here where, you know, it's all floating the idea that all these kind of ancient civilizations all had similar architectural kind of structure with pyramids and so forth, but they had no, as they say, Paul says, they had no way of knowing that mm. these other, like Egypt and the Aztec sort of history, like how they, they had no connection. So how would they sort of devise something that's somewhat similar? And then they sort of deploy this whole, you know, oh, the Predators helped them. And there's always conspiracy theories like, oh, the aliens had designed, you know, like Egypt and all that yeah. stuff. They, hey, idiots. It's just like, as in, as in Red Dwarf, as uh, Lister says, no, it was just loads of people with massive, yeah. massive whips. <laughs> massive, massive <laughs> whips. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They had massive whips for him. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, the whole theory is is kind of silly as well because it, it all hinges on the idea that it's unthinkable that yeah. human beings on different sides of the world should each come up with the idea of building the most simple geometric shape imaginable. <laughs> yeah. yeah if you, when you first start, start building it? things, what is the easiest thing to build when your technology is very, very limited? It's that, isn't it? Yeah. I always have the moment here where, obviously, because the predators got outnumbered, I think we'll just blow everything up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, we're losing. We're just going to cheat. <laughs> God, Anderson loved that shot as well. Have you seen him describing it? He gets yeah. really excited about that <laughs> shot that pans back, showing all this. I suppose back then it was more striking than it. Now it just looks like another CG blancmange to me. Yeah, it looks like something we actually, that's at the end of like Tomb Raider movie mm. you know something exploding all these bits flying everywhere but you, you were saying before we start recording because you'd listened to the audio commentary and uh which was a very as you yeah. described to me a very disorganized <laughs> recording well, it, it wasn't so much disorganized as um sanar lathan the um the, the actress playing lex the lead actress it, the problem really was just i don't think she realized that this is like a real job she, she's this is a real thing that she's doing. So she, she at one point she, she just starts, she just interrupts them to ask where a burger is. Starts talking about being hungry, <laughs> and they're kind of a little surprised. The, the other two in the commentary are Lance Henriksen and the director Paul Hansen, and they're kind of a bit surprised. And they start to think, oh, "Shall we stop? Do you want to do you want to stop the commentary?" And then there's all these, these sort of noises of well, that's never been done, kind of. And then she's like, "No, no, 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 don't worry." And then you realise for a while she's not said anything. Oh, she's gone off to get a fucking burger, hasn't she? She's... <laughs> so then you literally hear her coming back into the booth where they're recording, unwrapping her burger, eating it. But then they start chatting. How's your burger? Every <laughs> everything she says for twenty minutes, she says with her mouth full. <laughs> it's it's so weirdly unprofessional in in context. And then at the end, she just goes. She she keeps going on about how she's got something she needs to get to, some premiere she's going to. And then as soon as it's near the end of the movie. She obviously starts getting her stuff together because they start saying, "Oh, are you are you off? Are you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I got to get going." So, and the director even says to her, "Will you at least stay through the credits?" <laughs> She's like, and then you just never hear her voice again. So she obviously just went. Oh, amazing! Oh, it's so good, so good. But yeah, as you said, she like she obviously doesn't have a lot of respect for this movie. And looking at her career choices, I think you're probably right. I don't think she does. But the irony is, it's it's by far the best role she's ever had in a film. The biggest sort of blockbuster, you know what I mean? You could say. Yeah, she's the lead of a major movie. And yeah, her, no one knew who her she filmography. Was. She's mainly like you know second tier person in relatively minor film. Yeah. I can't help but think he was meant to be Jason. Is it Jason Patrick? Jason Patrick. Oh, you mean uh, what was he in? He was in Speed. He was quite big at this time. Oh yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. He, he looks just—it's exactly the kind of role he'd have been cast in. Speed two, in. wasn't he? Was yeah, he Speed, Speed two? two was his, yeah. <laughs> his big break. <laughs> big break. <laughs> 
Oh, the writer of Speed, Graham Yost, he, like, his friends took down his speed post and put up Speed 2 in his office. <laughs> <to annoy him. laughs> so I didn't write that movie. He's like... <laughs> that is Just... a... Pro- a lot of these complete disasters that we've all forgotten about when you go back and visit them they're often not that bad but no speed it's just, two is a car crash from start <laughs> to finish it's just awful it, it, it jan de bond it went from this like amazing sim photographer you know one of the best in the biz shot twister which is kind of like a silly kind of action movie which is enjoyed by a lot of people i i, I find the characters in it very irritating and over the top but, you know, he did Speed. He directed Speed. Great movie. And then yeah. he follows up with Speed 2. And then 2 made a 2, I think, Cradle of Life. <laughs> no, The Haunting. The Haunting was terrible. Yes. It did. Yeah. Absolutely awful. It's a kind of weird thing where I think with some photographers, if they've got, they can't do much of, they can't do much of a bad script, you know, as a director. Mm. Like, oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a yeah, pretty cool shot. Oh, he's bit, when she like, you see a face like sliding down, like a close up. It just looks awful. It's, uh, this, yeah, it's hard. This is it's a bit implausible. All this, isn't it? Really? Because <laughs> in the making of, you see, I think the alien in the film actually turns up next to him. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, and drags him. Yeah. I thought my memory sort of failed me there. I thought maybe the alien you didn't see it and just drags him off, but you do see it. This is like again like a video game sort of sequence or something yeah. like Tomb Raider, you know. Yeah. I mean, oh, Which was like a couple of years earlier. That film. All all these movies of Anderson's have that video game feel, don't they? Yeah. Well, he, he obviously played a lot of video games, didn't he? Some that mm. sort of generation. So, what he sees in the in the games, oh, I'll put that in the film. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's obviously Tomb Raider is all derived from Indiana Jones anyway, so it's just like yeah, it's just taking you know cliched moments from other movies and putting them in and sort of in a new twist but often the case it's just like oh I've seen that in another movie I always kept his Pepsi Cola thing to remind him that he's crap at his job I wonder I wonder if they got paid for that oh well, definitely that's a, that's a really good shot look at that that's a good wide they, actually they deploy that in that's really nicely lit as well yeah the, the ceiling there's a similar shot in that in Resident Evil 2 sequel, like just kind of corridor shot, you know, which Paul didn't direct, but he wrote that fucking terrible film. Yeah, that's another one that doesn't. I went back and watched all the Resident Evils a couple of years ago, <laughs> and that second one is, yeah, that's really is a piece of work. Yeah, well, it's, it's directed by an amazing second unit director, Alexander Witt, I think, but he just directed the movie by himself. I think he, he just had a turd of a script. Mm. Paul wrote probably in an afternoon, you know. I had to fight the nemesis monster in that movie. It's like a giant kebab monster. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's terrible. Ugh. You've got Predator standing there looking all cool. Let's be friends. <laughs> I know there was kind of talk of like, the, because we had the Freddy vs. Jason, which I think is a really entertaining movie. Funny enough, I just watched that at the weekend. Uh, did you? Just oh, saw nice. it. That is that is really good fun. Yeah, I, I could, yeah, I agree. I agree. I'd never seen it before. I did. I did a, a Nightmare on Elm Street video last Halloween. I'd never seen um, Freddy vs. Jason before, so I gave it a watch and thought, uh, well, well, that's that. Like whatever. But then watched it with my daughter actually the other the other day because she's just getting into that kind of movie, and I just thought this is brilliant. It's full of the best kills and the most ridiculous things. It's well shot, well directed, I think. It's a good director. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the guy who did Bride of Chucky, I think he did that one. Ah, uh, that's a great movie. I think there wasn't a talk of, like, obviously Ash was joining, like, this kind of team up. I think one of the... Is it one of the Jason movies that has, um, like, Necronomicon in it or some hand comes up and it's, like, referring to Evil Dead? I can't remember. I'm sure there's something... Oh, no, maybe there's some. They were going to do like a Hellraiser versus Jason versus. Yeah. You know, Evil well, Dead. I, man, I'd be on board for any of that shit. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they also, we had the sort of the team up of Batman v Superman, which was a terrible thing. <laughs> you know, I think the wrong wrong IPs to sort of mash up in a versus. I think you just need you need monster movies versus. You know what I mean? 
No, 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 it's fine. Just give Batman a, a really thick armor. Then, then it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Make a mind, man. I love this part here. Just like, just amp up the Predator. Just let him blow the shit out of those aliens. That, the Alien Queen is awesome, isn't it? It's, it's apparently great. it's the biggest animatronic ever built at the time. I don't know if it still is. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. And it's in-camera stuff. It's great. Yeah. You know? So I think it's still at this stage there, weren't they, where they were still using a lot of practical stuff mm. and combining it with CG. Um, also, you know, famously, also Lord of the Rings was a great combination of every element. You know, it wasn't yeah. just like George Lucas with like... A, this, I mean, no, the Star Wars prequels did have miniatures for a lot of the locations they built for like the wide shots. But I mean, when you've got mostly everything in CG, it doesn't stand up compared to Lord of no, the Rings. Yeah, I can't know. bear it. I can't bear it. And it, 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 this film is guilty of what a lot of films do when they mix the animatronic or the model and the CG version of a character as well. They have the Queen, the Alien Queen, has been presented to us chained up like this, moving in a certain way and mm. doing certain things, and we know it. It, it, it's the same problem in Alien Resurrection that when they suddenly start making them out of CG it means they can make them move in any way they want and move as fast as they want and do anything and as often as not that's what the problem is the CG, the image itself could be convincing but because it's suddenly behaving so differently it just doesn't seem right and that's that's all part of it there's a bit at the end when the when the alien queen is escaped and sort of chasing them when around. it's clearly cg and it just yeah. it looks completely wrong because the alien queen shouldn't move like that in my mind it's, it always had a sort of stop motion you kind of feel to her movement anyway which was just a rod puppet that kind of moved. when she did move you see her legs in the aliens move and stuff yeah it was very sort of uh limited in movement and you sort of that's what you think well, that's sort of how you sort of represent how she moves, but I, I I don't have an issue with the CG though with the Queen. I think it's actually well done. I mean, I think it's I think because of the the setting and the lighting, you can sort of get away with a lot. But it's um. I have a theory that almost no CG was ever lit correctly until. Well, actually, I don't think I think even now, it's it's a problem. It's it's always been my problem with CG is it, the way it's lit. They want you to see it. So the the classic example is that ridiculous puppet they added to return of the jedi oh god yeah that does it does a big singing is its mouth swings right open and it does this long mm. tone and you can see right down its throat and it's it's almost like it's lit from inside yeah but if that were real it, it would that, that throat would just kind of disappear into a murk of you know darkness because there's you can't see inside people's yeah but it, they but they, they over light everything in cg to my mind yeah to show you what they can do, and just like, well, it doesn't actually look real. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think part of, part of it's probably down to I used to work in in post production in in CG in three D as it was called, and I think part of the problem is you get it's one guy's job to make the model, and then it's another guy's it's like a lighting guy's job to then light it. Yes. So that's all that guy, that guy's whole life is lighting other people's CG. So you have to constantly stop them from getting carried away because it's yeah. no. We just need to be able to see it. it. Just needs to match the lighting scheme of the shot. We just need to, but they have to be creative and they, their work mm. wants to be noticed. You've got to, it's things that got to blend seamlessly. You know, if you if you don't, then you got to you end up destroying the illusion, isn't it? Mm. I love this little moment here because you know, they've got no dialogue and they've done a good job of making the predator sort of get across what he's saying you know mm, yeah that's true that's a really good point actually there, there is a really good sense of communication from the predators we were saying earlier about the sort of how the the uh aliens inside the people in uh, kind of form very quickly they've made this um alien uh home as it were or corridor very quickly you know they've, <laughs> they've, 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 been, they've been doing a lot of uh decorating I didn't even think about that, but yeah, it must. It has to be. <laughs> has to be aliens, you it's know. It's got to be new, like, isn't it? Yeah. What this film is missing is a cat. <laughs> then it'd be, it'd be perfect, <laughs> wouldn't it? I always love that bit of trivia on the first one where Ripley goes back to get the cat and they previewed it and the cinematographer just said he was there and someone shouted, Leave the fucking cat! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is this would have been 
the perfect movie for one of these idiot characters to have sneaked their cat into their backpack because they don't want to leave it on its own or something. Yeah. And then right at the end, it escapes and they've got to go and find it. Oh, man, yeah. Cause no one wants their pet to die. That's a really good shot, the lighting there, where you see uh, Raul Bova kind of just stuck up against a wall. And because they've done it so many times, the studio ADI, they know exactly what how to get it to look right and um, yeah. give it the horror element. But... I do like, though, even though it's kind of a cheesy moment to appease teenagers with a face hugger, bursts out and he grabs it, predator captures it, and then he just breaks, he just kills it with his thumb. He just goes, <laughs> essentially breaks its neck or whatever. God, she, she's just awful, isn't she? Really? Yeah, she's not good. I mean, they're both not great, are they? I mean, no. that's the problem. I mean, this is, this is almost exactly the same scene Sigourney Weaver played and the contrast is quite striking but it's, <laughs> it's kind of like the moment where the sort of deleted scene that would eventually be in a special edition where she finds La- uh not lambert um dallas you know where he's being cocooned and she's goes she's like what do i do you know and he just kill and she has to kill him and that's the, the I mean, you totally buy it but in this it's just like just bad acting you know yeah that's cool <laughs> Yeah, okay. Apparently they've got necks like us. <laughs> She's free! She's free! It, I, I do like the way they made it really big, actually, because it does make it more intimidating. Oh, for sure. It's got, you've got the end-of-level boss now. Yeah. Look at that charging through. I mean, you know, it's the thing with filmmaking and doing these sequels, you have to sort of show people something more than what you've seen before. So they are, mm. you know, showing you the Queen doing a lot more. And it's the last time we've seen the Queen do do something, you know, and uh, have a sort of face off against a predator of all things, which you probably never expected in your youth to see this sort of happen. Um but did you did you did we, did we need to see it? I don't know. But, <laughs> yeah, there might have been a reason why debate. we never expected it. If it was a it. vote, it was a vote taken. But nah, best not. I, I I think there's crazier ideas than a, than rebooting this franchise. To be honest, uh, AVP. If I was going to do it, reboot it. I'll just have it in the future. You know, mm. you could have it on a, you know, to piece the fans, big Solaco ship, and then have everyone cornered off by. The predators invading, and then they've got like aliens on there on board. You can, st- you can you can still do it relatively cheap, but have it on a giant spaceship. Yeah, you know, and in the well, future, and you can have all the pulse rifles, smart guns to have all the fans they can wank to it. You know. <laughs> I feel like there's um that there's something to be grown from that from prey. The was it last year that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. The general tone and style of that could be employed because you could almost do it without human characters you could almost do it as you know dialogue free yeah and pray showed you can do that yeah there wasn't a huge amount of dialogue she had to have that moment where she goes you know you one ugly mother and it cuts yeah. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> fuck off <laughs> this pit here is like so it's again aping predator where they're running from the fire, I think it's all cracking yeah. up behind them, trying to escape it. Oh, you forgot they they just leave, they actually hang up those bodies near the entrance. You sort of don't really see <laughs> that, you know. Probably a bit too disturbing for a PG thirteen. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant Action moment. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of this is miniature miniature work as well, where they destroy the town. Uh, I really want I really want it to cut to a shot of them high fiving each other now. Oh yeah, oh that'd be so good. You son of a bitch <laughs> <laughs> One day to retirement this year. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh that's oh, that looks awful to me, that the CG <laughs> um snow blasting up. Well, there's an interesting fact, wasn't it, about the snow? That it was like, like a, it was a sort of wax stuff yeah. that uh, kind of created for the day after tomorrow, which is out the same year, but they mm. 
that kind of pioneered the, the new snow effect on that film that was deployed on this. So the snow kind of that's on camera kind of is quite effective. That's a good shot. There's some. He has to show her his face. I'm the sexy predator. <laughs> <laughs> when he like roars oh, at her, yeah. in most reactions you'd be like, ah! <laughs> "Shit!" Well, hell. I know, but also, also look at her face. I think it's this scene. I remember thinking, like, oh, no. yeah, it's like she doesn't know what she's looking at, does she? The actress has no idea what she's meant to be reacting to here. It seems like. <laughs> I think there might be another moment of that where it's CG. Can I uh, burn your face? Yeah. No. <laughs> In case the audience forgot. <laughs> oh, you were like, oh, you fucker, that really hurt. <laughs> Why isn't it melting his finger? <laughs> We can now be friends. My name is David. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that there's a, there's a one of the later Alien v Predator comic books has a character who actually ends up uh, a female human character who actually ends up being like one of the predators. She's so good they adopt oh, her. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I never read that. I've I've seen imagery from that, and it, yeah, it definitely rings a bell. I get the idea. Some of this came from that, and likewise, a lot. I, I feels like I'm um, prey. The uh, leans back into that story. I just read a synopsis of it, and it seems like Prey might have uh, been inspired a bit by that idea too. Oh, my back! So we actually get to see the tail properly in, the, in this version as well. Yeah, that is kind of cool. I think that's a good that's a good shot. I think. I mean, I you know, it's, John, it's John Bruno does the effects. I, mean, I think he's brilliant at uh, visual effects. You know, I didn't I, the sense of scale, the the, the sense mm. of weight of the thing somehow just wasn't quite right for me. Doesn't quite right for you now. And th this this running business just doesn't that just doesn't look right for a, a creature we've hitherto only seen as an animatronic. It's yeah, that's, yeah, I know what you mean. I, I, it's the execution in terms of making it look right. I think it's kind of fine, but but it's like the process of seeing the queen do that. It's um, yeah, that's yeah. I think like a still image doesn't translate. It, a know. still image is convincing, but there's some could be and a, a lot of that's down to the way it's it's you know it's been so desaturated and it's quite dark and they've they've been quite clever about how they you know how they help the CG artists. That's a great shot. That's a good shot when the predator comes in. Yeah. But I say I think you'd probably care more about the scene if it was a character that we that we were invested in. Yeah. And if it was like in a situation where we saw Arnold at this point where he wasn't yeah. too old. Because this is what he was meant. To, he was meant to turn up at the end, wasn't he? Or there was a, a, a there was a oh. hope that he would. And apparently, he agreed to do it if, according to what I read anyway, if um, it could be shot in his house, and only on the basis that he didn't win his second term as governor of California, and he ended up really he ended up winning. So can, and I've read that in a few places. I get the, I get the impression that's true. He comes. He's he's been. Tempted back a number of times, like for Predator Three during the nineties, that he kind of didn't want to repeat himself. He bailed, bailed out of that. There was talk of him coming back for like the Predator film, which Shane Black had directed for yeah. that kind of ending. But I think really that film should have ended, even though not everyone loved it. But Adrian Brody should have just popped up at the end as a sort of <laughs> nod to Predators. I mean, it would, it would have made more sense. Yeah, I, know. I really enjoyed that last one. I thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> The, not the last one, not Prey. The the oh, the Predator. Yeah, yeah the one art. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was a complete clusterfuck of uh, editing, wasn't it? As well, loads of stuff missing from that film. Yeah. So so yeah, apparently it, his cameo. It was only going to be a cameo, and it was set for the end. And I'm not sure whether the idea was he turned up and saved the day, 
or I, I think that would have been a bit. I mean, I, I'd have loved it. It'd have been hilarious, but it was a, it's a bit much, isn't it? And but it maybe undermined her character. She's yeah. kind of just left behind now, isn't she? So perhaps he's part of the crew that turns up now and kind of takes her, rescues her, and takes her home. And he's maybe he's just got one line like, "Wow, what happened here?" or something. Yeah, yeah. But then it still would have been a massive cop out because you've sort of gone, oh, I wish he did some action or something, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, because you see like the giant predator ship just appears above them because it's like, as I always say with UFOs, people who have been abducted or whatever will see them. They don't make any noise and there's no sound, they just yeah. appear. So this is kind of throwing in that sort of idea that they've been watching the entire time. Yeah. And, and it's like literally right next to them. I suppose no one ran into that, you know. But... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or notice, considering it's been snowing throughout almost the whole movie, you'd have you'd, have, you'd have noticed a huge the snow would have been gathering on top, and underneath it wouldn't have been snowing. <laughs> so oh. All the predators are buff and fat. It's like no, that's not predators. Well, presumably these are the adult, uh, like the old adult ones. But we saw the old adult one in Predator 2, though, Rob, and he was slim. Oh, that's true, yeah. And he, had a, he gave her the gun, you see, yeah. from 16, 15 or whatever. Which actually connects to Prey, right? Isn't there a gun in that? I think there was, wasn't there? Yeah, I yeah. think there is a reference. Yeah. And I, I, a lot of people credit the, uh, Predator 2 for this movie as well because of that skull, that alien skull in the end. Yeah. Oh, for course, some reason, yeah. no, one, no one seems to have known. Which we haven't even discussed, have we? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it it's it, it because it because that Predator Two was made after the original AVP comics, so yes, they put it in as a nod. To yeah, that might yeah. be the first time that we, as a mainstream audience, saw the connection. But it was already mm. established, so it's not maybe not not quite so important that it happens in Predator Two because it sort of showed you, like to an audience at the time, that it was oh these worlds are connected. But it was more of a sort of nod to the comics, but also probably a, a like an in joke as because. You know, mm. they'd both worked on those films, the yeah. makeup effects guys, you know. But you see, I think you see her kind of walk off and you see the vehicles in the background. Um, yeah, yeah. I still just want Dutch to step into shot smoking a cigar there, though. In, in, his, in, his, jung, in his short-sleeved jungle outfit. <laughs> he, he doesn't get cold in this weather, does no, he? Uh, no, he's, he's got a cigar to power him. Dutch doesn't wear coats. <laughs> she's gonna go go back to the boat and you know you know sort of sail back herself i don't know yeah i, I was thinking that yeah who did they leave a crew behind on that they must have done cause... they must have done yeah and it all teases oh, the sequel I wonder is, what's uh, going to happen here See the sequel. I like. We might have to do the sequel at some point, Rob. Because <laughs> there's some interesting stuff in it, but it's mostly terrible. Because it's literally like an '80s horror movie, isn't it? Like aimed at teen, like for like having young people in it at a school. And oh god, you just you just think on paper like this would not work, and they go, yeah, it, it should do, and then they make it. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, who commissioned that? You know, can we make it so dark that nobody notices it doesn't work? <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Screen story. I mean, like, yeah, yeah Dan O'Bannon. It's weird. Said, it's really weird. So weird. I'm I'm ninety nine point nine percent certain they had nothing to do with it. They're not even interviewed for the documentaries. I don't. Yeah, you know, as you heard the commentary, I don't think Paul referenced them in terms no. of like but their why, contributions. You know, I, I can understand why it's. Mm. It's definitely not their writing in this movie. It's it's. Dan O'Bannon would write dialogue very differently. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine those says, two writing the dialogue you know, for this somehow. Yeah. So, final thoughts, Rob. Does it, do you think it's still whole? Because I know you said you didn't like it when it came out. Yeah, no, well, it, it isn't a very good film, is it? But then I, I think I'd maybe developed a, a slightly different approach to good and bad. But like I say, I, I just love the. I love the fact that it's so contained. I love the fact that the characters are this team of warring, even though they are totally disappointing, are this team of sort of warring components. And once it, it, 
the structure of it is also really entertaining. It, 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 mm. There's no like long stretches of boring nonsense. There's plenty of long stretches where nothing good happens, but there's always something happening. It's mm. it's it keeps you engaged, and I just wish... it has a, has a generally a pretty good pace to it. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's a. I mean, I don't know exactly how long it is either, but I'm going to guess hour 40, it's hour forty eight. There you go. That's yeah. the correct length of time for a film like this. Now, now it'd be two and a half hours. Oh, yeah. So I mean, I, I'm never going to. I'm never going to fight to defend it if I'm honest. But <laughs> I enjoy it. Up I, in court, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I do agree with you about the sort of the premise of the idea, and I think it would. It, it's 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 if you're going to set it in the past, and it's got it's got to be an, on. Located in an, uh, Antarctica, yeah, and uh, a hostile environment, and a sort of deploy these monsters, and the humans are kind of stuck in the middle trying to escape. And uh, it's just unfortunate that Paul had wrote had written this, and um, he's not very good at writing characters. Yeah, I think that's it. It's the dialogue and the characters. Is it? It's not the structure. It's not the it's the script rather than the screenplay. I suppose if you're going to make yeah. a distinction between the two things, he's good at coming up with good ideas. You know, yeah. I, I don't fault him on that. And um, he's obviously got a good eye. Yeah. He he, he, can, he he always sets up the shots. There's always establishing scenes. He knows how to construct a movie well. But it's just like you're looking at it from a even like from still shots. You think, oh, that looks like an interesting film. And he's sort of when it all kind of comes together, you just something's not working. Like the cogs of the system, you know, uh, things aren't fully greased. And it's like you're seeing you, you just never get invested in the characters he creates. Mm, um, that's and exactly it. And when we, we, which is the opposite in terms of Mortal Kombat and Event Horizon, which you didn't write, and you are invested in those characters. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just kind of, they've given him a bit too much freedom. I think he's he, they, he, he's, he has allowed that freedom because he has been successful. And he has turned these studios a profit and said, well, we'll just give him, let him do what he wants because we know it's going to get some money back. I think some of his later efforts, he's kind of, I don't know, not hitting quite as well. I mean, the Pompeii movie was terrible. The yeah. Musketeer movies he did was kind of overblown and silly and I don't think it's nowhere near as good as the, the classics by Richard Lester, but um, I think he did another video. He did another video game adaptation of a monster something. I can't remember some Capcom game. Yeah, Monster was, Hunt is it or something? Yeah. Hunt, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. You, I, I haven't really noticed any of his films for years coming out. And like you say, if they if they are getting, because I think the reason he keeps getting a chance is number one, he's because because he also he wrangled uh, Mortal Kombat. Based purely on the fact that they liked the way shopping looked, his debut movie, his low budget, which is terrorist, a rubbish, but no one liked it. No one thought it was any good. But somehow he managed to parlay a disappointing film no one liked into a chance at a, at a fairly significant property. And I think that's because he can do the talk, but then he delivers on time and on budget, and studios freaking love that. You know that's almost more important than everyone, whether or not anyone likes the movie. Well, he was part of that ninety scene of you know young British directors making yeah. it to America with like Danny Boyle, Danny Cannon, you know, with Josh yeah. Dredd. So and and Danny Cannon didn't really hit it off because he went, I think he went into TV, but he's he's successful in that area, but he didn't really make any more movies after mm. Josh Dredd and uh, and Paul, as you say, managed to sort of hit it off with Mortal Kombat and his career was sort of defined by that kind of movie and and that sort of genre kind of entertaining a certain age group. Yeah. And uh Danny Boyle, obviously the most successful out of the out of the bunch critically, I think, as well, you know, did some amazing movies. Uh, but it's kind of that weird that weird time where these young British directors were sort of finding their footing and sort of getting noticed by America who were yeah. looking for new talent who they could they knew were talented but they can hire them for a very certain budget you know hire them on the cheap and they were making films about um the generation that was watching them I think that's why they they maybe struck such a chord all those early they knew films, what was cool they knew what was interesting you know? yeah like sh- uh, shallow grave uh shopping uh, th- those th- they're they're all kind of about the same sort of people yeah yeah, as as was train spotting. Would you probably say this is probably you know the biggest IP that Paul had dealt with? Do you think at the time? Oh, I suppose it must be. Yeah, it's it's more pressure than to Kombat. deliver on this. You know what I mean? Yeah, Mortal Kombat was huge, wasn't it? Yeah, and Resident Evil was big as well. But I mean, in terms of a general audience, this is probably the biggest. Yeah, IP. Yeah, because it, uh, it's because it's well beyond the gaming world as well, isn't it? It's mm. just a broader world. And, you're, and I suppose it's also incorporating comic books because it's so influence 
more than either of Alien films or Predator films. I think the comics are bigger influence. You could argue, that, is this more a successful comic book movie than an actual uh, yeah. sequel to Predator or Alien? It, you know? it, that, I think that's a more accurate description. Really, because I mean, it is literally a comic book adaptation. Whereas you could, you can start saying, "Well, is it a spin-off or a sequel or or a prequel?" Yeah. Well, yeah, yes, that's that's the thing. I mean, and now it's been kind of, it's not part of that franchise anymore in terms of the 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 continuity of the story, mm. because obviously Prometheus have changed who Wayland is. Wayland is Guy Pearce. You know, I, I prefer this version, honestly. I, I, I genuinely do. I really genuinely do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't get those two new Alien. Well, Prometheus is okay, but the, yeah, Alien Covenant. Yeah, it was. Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier about the sort of Ridley Scott using the, the names. Obviously, Michael Fassbender is called David, and then the earlier version of him is called Walter. So Walter Hill and David Carroll. You know. Obviously, producers of Alien, so oh, he kind of that's how he referenced them. I'm seeing yeah. a bunch of names I know here. We're obviously onto really? the CG. Yeah, I used to work yeah. with Doug Lamore, and wow! If only you'd known earlier, you could have chased them up. <laughs> going, oh, did you, did you, what was it like doing the effects on this? And everyone's like, "Fucking nightmare!" Well, hang on, <laughs> what? Like, you know, what, what year was this? Two thousand four. So Wait a minute, was, are, you, are you on so this, you, Rob? <laughs> there, you know, there is an outside chance my name might even be in these credits somewhere. <laughs> that was double negative. We just went. You were cine site. Cine site. No, I was moving picture company at this moving point. But so, company. but so was Doug Lamore. So I, I would have been, um, I'd have been like a, a data op at this point. So doing like um, a, a really minor work on all the projects going through. So often things you know you, you forget about the ones you worked on, frankly, in that capacity because yeah, yeah. you had such a small, irrelevant role. I'm sure you would have known. <laughs> I think your memory hadn't have failed you that badly for you to go, am I in this film? Did I work on this film? <laughs> I, I, I did work on, to- on Tomb Raider, which we've mentioned. That was a, yeah. that was a complete that was, disaster. <laughs> that was three years earlier. Well, that's 2001. That was, yeah, that was one of the first things. I, yeah, I did, um, I think I might have said this on another comment, but I did... Um, yeah, like uh, editorial tidying up the thirty-five millimeter print afterwards. Is what, I think I think they'd done the work, and then I started work there, and it, all the, all the print had to be logged, all the individual versions of all the individual shots. Oh, God. just basically admin sounds like horrible <laughs> admin. Exactly. Richard Conway, I recognise that guy's name. Shepperton, yeah, they've obviously done. Is, is that yeah? I mean, Thomas Wanker. Additional <laughs> music by Thomas Wanker. <laughs> <laughs> And there he is again, sequence programming by Thomas White. Thomas Wanker got everywhere. Bloody hell. My God. Well, yeah, so, it, it, you know, I've not seen this film for maybe about, maybe about five years. You, you sort of go back to it now and again. So it's not unwatchable at all. And I think it's, as you sort of said about its pace, it's kind of mo- it whips along at a, you know, a decent, decent amount, you know, of time. And it's got some interesting shots in it. Some, some of the CG kind of still kind of stands up for me. But it, it is, I, I, as an, at the time, you know, I was the right, I was kind of the right age group, maybe a little bit too old, perhaps, because I was over, how old I? I've been twenty two at the time, so it, yeah, as a it, kind of trying to appease the video game players of the game and the comics and that sort of teenage age, age group. But yeah, I think it was too soft. It needed to be an eighteen, it needed the violence, mm. and um, and it needed the characters I can care about. And and they tried to rectify that in the sequel by increasing more of the violence. But they, again, they actually may actually deliver characters who you care even less about. You yeah. know, I think that absolutely nails it. That absolutely nails the problems this film has. Yeah, it's it's always difficult writing. You know. The characters that you want the audience to care about, and it's but, but they think introduced. I think if they introduced less characters, I think it would have been. Yeah. I think they could have resolved that uh, in the story in the script because often you've got too many characters. You you've all got to give them dialogue, so you end up with like characters who would have delivered most of it. They all just get separated to give these other characters something to say. Yeah. And it ends up becoming this kind of dumps of exposition where everyone's kind of finishing even where everyone's sentences. You know, to sort of give them this. You know, enough screen time, mm. um, and it also needed a better score. It needed something really just like, "This is Predator, this is Aliens," and they kind of do that in a sequel. They do a nod to the Predator theme and the Alien theme, but then Brian Tyler creates his own kind of like mashup, kind of like a 
score for AVP, which is actually really is a lot better. But uh, but it's a shame, Rob, you didn't see your name there. If it was, that would have been great. <laughs> you know, a bit a nice, it would have been a nice surprise for you, wouldn't it? To be honest, I, I doubt very much I'd have been important enough to bother getting an actual on-screen credit. <laughs> you get you get screwed out of them very easily, and you know? I yeah, you do. Uh, yeah, I've heard that heard that story many a time. Well, everyone, that is the end of the commentary. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm sure me and Rob will be back to cover Requiem, perhaps. We'll see. <laughs> American we, Ninja 2. American, American Ninja, Ninja 2. 2, yeah. <laughs> American Ninja 2 next, yep. Yeah. Then it's AVP 2, I think. All the sequels. <laughs> well, everyone, take care of yourselves and goodbye for now. Cheers.